Um, good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to invite you to this session of a very interesting meeting. And uh, the first presentation today is Zan uh, Schutten. Uh, she's at the University of Champaign Urbana or Urbana Champaign, uh, my alumni. Uh, and uh, she's going to talk about macroeconomics of a minimal cell integration of experiments, theory, and simulation. Thank you. I'd like to begin by thanking the organizers for inviting me to speak at this workshop. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today about the microeconomics of the minimal cell. And this work really requires the integration of experiment theory and simulations. It's only possible through collaborations with experimentalists at the Greg Venter Institute, our NSF Center for the Physics of Living Cells, the Max Planck Institute in, uh, in Munich, and colleagues at the Uni uh, Dresden, as well as UCSD. Um, the time is ripe to be able to do these cell simulations because of the availability of biological information and the revolution in GPU computing for both simulations as well as visualization. So uh, what I will talk to you today about is um, sort of our, our achievements and remaining challenges to simulate the economy of a minimal cell. And if time permits, I'll show you one or two slides of our work on modeling a human cell, the HeLa cell, and looking at uh, spliceosome dynamics, uh, work that was done with uh, Martin Grubala at the University of Illinois. So, uh, why the minimal cell? Uh, I think if you just take a look at the gene map comparing its genes with those of the model organism E. coli, it has about half, about 5 million base pairs and 4,600 genes, and the minimal cell is one-tenth in, in every dimension, one-tenth of the number of base pairs as well as the genes. Uh, the genes that I'm showing here are those that code for proteins, and they come in categories of metabolism, genetic information, processing, and cellular processes like growth. And if you go over to the minimal cell, you'll see those areas sort of reverse size, so the metabolism has been greatly reduced. But most importantly, look at the gray area. About 40% of the genome in E. coli contains genes that they don't know what they do. You still have unknown genes in uh, the minimal cell, but this number, 91, is already beginning to decrease. And because of that decrease, I'll be able to talk to you about a more realistic model for mRNA uh, decay. Along with this gene map, we also know from our collaborators uh, uh, information on gene essentiality. And they do this through transpose and insertion data. So every gene has been declared either to be essential, quasi-essential, or non-essential. So we can take the gene map along with the proteomics data and redraw it so that now we put them into these blocks. We'll concentrate mostly on the essential part. And if you put in the proteomics data, these polygons now have different sizes. And if you happen to like numbers, in this eLife paper in 2019, we have all this information recorded there for all 452 of the protein coding genes. Now, what does the minimal cell look like? Well, it's about 400 nanometers wide, uh, and the, the cell itself was developed uh, by colleagues from the synthetic biology group at the J. Craig Venter Institute. Clyde Hutchinson and Hamilton Smith lead that group, and um, my postdoc, Miriam Breuer, uh, worked with them to establish the metabolic network for all the essential uh, uh, enzymes. It has about 155 genes, 338 re reactions, and 304 metabolites. Uh, the bacterial genetic information processing is very much like other bacteria, which we'd also worked on before, and it contains about 210 uh, genes. Now, what are we talking to you about first is the genetic information processing system, and then we'll move on to metabolism, and then our attempts to, be, to combine them. 
So when we look at genetic information processing, it is, as everyone knows, primarily a stochastic process. So we'll be using two techniques to examine the dynamics. One will be the chemical master equation. If we assume everything is well stirred in the cell, and we'll just calculate how the state of the cell changes, and the state being defined by the counts of proteins, messengers, whatever we have in the cell, and there'll be reactions that take it out of that state or take it into that state. When we start putting in a metabolism, that can be treated by normal, uh, ordinary differential equations, so we'll have hybrid CME ODE methods. When we want to take into account, and we really should when possible, the spatial heterogeneity in the cell, we'll have to use the reaction diffusion master equation. So to that reaction uh, operator, we add a diffusion operator. And you'll see at the bottom uh, such a simulation on E. coli, and the DNA is in the center in this case, and the ribosomes of the other large objects are surrounding it, and you'll see a gene going off and on. Now, information that we needed for the kinetics, the diffusion coefficients, those were supplied by many of our experimental collaborators. And the picture on the left is just to remind you that the cell is, if you put in all the biomolecules, and is really quite full, anywhere from 40 to 50% uh, filled with macromolecules. So how does, uh, what are we doing exactly with the reaction diffusion master equation in our lattice microbe software? Imagine on the right, you have a picture of a part of a cell here. The outside is green. You have a boundary, a membrane, a cytoplasm, and a nucleoid region. So um, you'll put in particles. This will be known from various omics experiments. Uh, you'll discretize the space to a lattice. And the particles, what can they do within each, within each of those lattice sites? They can either react, as you see here at the top, up here, or they can diffuse from one lattice site to another. Now, what are our time steps? They're typically of microseconds, and the, the state, as I said, of each of the cell at each time point is defined by the particle count in each of those subvolumes. So let's begin with initiation of DNA replication, one of the key genetic information processing reactions. So uh, the initiation begins with the formation of a DNAA filament. So to the origin of the, um, uh, of the circular DNA, this multi-domain protein, DNAA, binds to a high signature or high affinity binding site um, to the double-stranded part. And it, along with some uh, nucleoid-associated proteins, helps to bend the protein, uh, bend the DNA, so then uh, the, the other domains of the DNAA can bind to the single-stranded DNA. And that's what you're seeing in this next uh, panel here. So you have the DNAA binding uh, here to these sites, and now it starts opening it up, so other of the domains of DNAA can come in and start making a filament. Now, uh, that other domain needs three nucleotides, uh, to bind, so and it looks for an AT-rich region, which you have right here next to the signature of about 90 uh, nucleotides, so it should form a filament of about 30 in length. Um, and that's what you're seeing uh, here is how we built the kinetic model uh, for this uh, filament formation. Uh, it, the kinetic data was obtained from some single molecule FRET experiments where they could flow in DNAA and then measure uh, through the FRET uh, signal uh, how many were added and the rate at which they were added. So now you have the rates, the off and on rates from this paper. Now, once you have the bubble open, the replosomes are in, you start the, the uh, replication portion. And for that, we use these polymerization models that have been suggested already back in 2013. So um, the replication models, and I won't have time to go into great detail about them, we're gonna use similar ones for DNA replication, where the, the template is a single-stranded DNA, the enzyme is 
uh, the DNA polymerase, and the monomers that get added are the deoxynucleotides. In transcription, again, it will be the single-stranded DNA. The, the enzyme will be the RNA polymerase, and here the, the monomers will be the nucleotides. In translation, the, the template is the messenger, the enzyme is the ribosome, and the monomers that get added are the, are the amino acids. So how long does this all take in these stochastic simulations? So uh, here we have a, a time of about 40 minutes. These are four replicates that you're looking at, or five. And you can see sometimes the filament is formed within five minutes, 10 minutes. Here's one 15, and there's some that can even be longer. So you get an entire distribution of formation times of this filament. Once the filament is formed, any of those cells, any of the thousands of cells that we considered can now start the replication of the DNA. So if you average over those thousand, this is how long it takes, about 60 minutes out of the total of 105 minute doubling time. That's what it takes to make and replicate on average the DNA. So what is the effect of having a, another copy of DNA on the mRNA noise of any single gene? Well, the simple answer is it'll just make more of those messengers. So now instead of having just one copy, we have a second copy. So let's see how that is reflected in our simulations. If we look at a single messenger from a single cell, we'll see after about 60 minutes, you start seeing fluctuations to higher um, messenger numbers. That is again just from a single cell. If we take a thousand cells and look at all the 155 uh, metabolic genes, then we get on average the most that you can get is like about six copies of the messengers. You'll see we started with an initial condition of assuming every gene had essentially one messenger, but you see that many of them uh, if you were to average over the whole time length, that there are often moments where you don't have any uh, of the messengers being formed. Now, uh, and that's for the metabolic proteins. We also looked at the ribosomal proteins and sort of similar numbers in terms of mRNA uh, abundance. So how does this reflect what happens uh, when we have um, when we look at translation and the number of proteins that we obtain, we should, on average, at the end of 105 minutes, have double the number of, that, of proteins that we know from the proteomics numbers. So you can see that's our highest peak, but we do tend to overproduce some proteins. And these are anomalies which we, I, I can explain to you, but uh, for, uh, for the sake of time, I'll, I'll skip that. One of the things I should mention, that in our polymerization models, there's a basic rate of polymerization, but each of the processes has to be modified slightly, in that there may be an additional factor having to do with uh, the promoter uh, strength uh, of that gene. So we have a factor that allows that. And also uh, in translation, if we have a particularly long transcript, we also allow for uh, polysomes. So, how do things change as we go and consider the spatial heterogeneity? Uh, as we did with E. coli, we go back and we start looking at the cryo-electron tomograms. These are done by Vincent Lab, Lamb in the Elizabeth Vila's lab at UCSD. And he was able to collect the data for uh, SYN3A, this minimal cell, in several different states. So uh, the cell was, and uh, here's a sort of a small, um, a me, uh, oh, I'm losing my pointer. So a small, a medium, oh, Lord, uh, and a large cell, and each of them has a varying number in ribosomes. We're gonna concentrate mostly on the small cell. And um, so what do we do with that information? Well, uh, uh, we can build a, a cell, but in addition, now that that 91 number of unknown proteins has been decreased slightly, we now know all the components that go into making the degradosome complex in the minimal cell, which is responsible for decaying the messenger, either from the three prime to the five prime end, or from the five prime to the three prime end, 
or chopping things up in, in the center. So in our reaction diffusion master equation uh, simulations, this will be just represented by a big red dot, but now the messenger will have to diffuse to this complex before it can uh, decay. In the previous simulations, which were just chemical master equation, we assumed a uniform and average decay time of four minutes, which had been motivated by a study, a genome-wide study that had been done on bacillus in, in I think, about 2004. So uh, here's how we set up our simulations. We start with the ribosomes from the tomograms. We add in the circular DNA. And so here's the beginning, and it's colored uh, red, white, and blue, very patriotic. And um, as you can see, uh, it meanders through the cell. It's not localized as we saw in the coli cell. And we were able to uh, put this into this geometry using a self-avoiding random walk. To that picture now, we're going to add those uh, degradosomes. These are going to be on the membrane, which I'm not showing you yet. And there's about 120 of them is sort of the minimum number that we put in based on the proteomics. So here's what it's going to look now, look like as we put it into this visualization software VMD. So we have the ribosomes. Now I've made the, 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 the DNA or the cyan color. I've added now the uh, degradosomes. You can see them here sort of embedding into the membrane and they'll be fixed and won't move in these simulations. And then we add all the proteins and the messengers. So here is our first simulation uh, on this system. Uh, I want you to look primarily into this region. And what I'm gonna show you uh, is the ribosomes are gonna change color uh, depending on whether uh, they are a messenger is bound to them. And the same way with the degradosome. If it's bound with a messenger, it'll turn blue. If it's free, it'll turn red. So let's hope this goes. There you go. So you'll see like if a ribosome, it contains a messenger for a while, then releases it, and a degradosome is nearby, like in the center there, it'll immediately take up the messenger and start decaying it. Uh, if the degradosome is further away from the messenger, uh, excuse me, is the degradosome is further away from the ribosome, it will take longer. So what we're looking at, though, at the moment is just the first sort of 20 minutes. So we haven't taken into account uh, DNA replication, and we've kept the ribosome sort of fixed where they were in the tomogram. So what do we get? Uh, what are our results of those simulations? If we look at the average mRNA count, then again, this is for all 155 metabolic genes, but these simulations take much longer uh, to do than the chemical master equation simulations. So we first just looked over five cells, and you can see the number is like two, and it was compared to the five and six that we saw uh, in the previous treatment. If we look at the decay times of the messengers, we get a decay time where the average is about one minute uh, and decays, and then you even have a few that are out here at very long times. Now, this does agree with uh, more recent measurements and reports from uh, microplasmas, um, but in general, the, the average should be closer to two minutes. So I think this means that our number of uh, messengers should be a little bit higher. I should also point out that in these first set of simulations, uh, we use the same diffusion coefficients for all the messengers, uh, where in our previous studies on ribosome biogenesis, we had made the messengers, uh, we calculated their diffusion coefficient based on their hydrodynamic radius. And that will, that's what we'll do. Again, if you compare the proteins for all 452 proteins, um, this is only a 20-minute simulation, so the peak should be closer to over here to 1.2. It's more at 1.1. So we slightly um, underproduce uh, 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 proteins based on the proteomics number. So that takes care of genetic information processing. Let's go to that next big block in the gene map, and that deals with uh, metabolism. And 
uh, in producing this minimum genome, they essentially had cut out almost all redundant genes. So we can talk of an essential metabolism of a minimal cell. And it has various uh, subsystems like lipids, um, glycolysis, uh, nucleotide metabolism, cofactors, amino acids. And those are, even this reduced model has enough complexity or reactions that uh, co-workers uh, came specialized in each of these subsystems. And you're seeing their pictures here. And uh, poor Zane here had to do double duty. So he did both the uh, genetic information processing uh, module as well as the main metabolic pathway. So if we're going to start combining metabolism with genetic information processing, um, we're moving up here, particularly because of the metabolites into the regime of higher concentrations. So we're going to think about using ordinary differential equations or partial differential equations to describe the metabolic reactions. And we'll still couple it with the CME either or the RDME um, for the genetic information processing. We showed how to do these hybrid simulations already on a study in yeast in 2018, so we know how to do it. So one of the first things we looked at is how does the sugar, how do the nutrients get into the cell? Uh, it, it takes up uh, glucose, and there's a very famous PTSG phospho-relay system, and our modeling of the kinetics of this system is in agreement with the uh, measured fluxes. So that's at the top now of this metabolic map, uh, I, re I realize it's quite small print, but this is where you have the glucose coming in. This is the shunt off to lipids, and this is the shunt off to make uh, 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 nucleotides and cofactors. And there's some feedback through linking, metabolite, uh, linking metabolites back into the metabolic network. So if you take in these 14,000 glucose, you can produce, depending if you go straight down or also have some acetate secretion, anywhere from 25,000 to 35,000 ATP being produced per second. So let's get over to nucleotide metabolism. So I think that's most closely related to the genetic information processing that we did. Um, so to, get the, to make the nucleotides, which is down here, and I'm only showing you uh, the, the, the pathway to make uh, the purine uh, guanine, you can have uh, uh, it coming in from the uh, as the base, or you can have it come in as the nucleoside. The nucleoside is ATP driven, but the interesting thing is, is that with only one or two, or two to three uh, ATPs, you arrive at the nucleotide. This you have to compare to the 57 that are required in E. coli. What's interesting is if you look at the supply that comes either from the medium or the supply that comes in from the degradation of the messenger, which gives rise to recycling, and now having the monophosphates available, you have almost enough to just have this be a zero-sum game to make the messengers as well as the ribosomal proteins. The same way here to make the nucleotides that you need to make DNA. So what do you do with those remaining you know, 20,000 ATPs well, you need to go back and to look into each of these reactions and count up how many involve transport or ATP driven. Uh, how many, I don't even show you the transport for the ions, pumping the protons out. So it's almost a zero, it almost balances. And that you know, difference in that balance gives rise to what they call a pool size of, of nucleotides and deoxynucleotides that are available to the cell. So where are we now with this uh, uh, system? Well, we have now made metabolic and uh, genetic information processing kinetic models, starting to combine them. Uh, we want to really get at the minimal rules of life. And this we're doing by looking at correlations between the networks and growth. Uh, on the experimental side, many of our results are being tested and validated by our experimental colleagues at our Physics Frontier Center, uh, our, the J. Craig Venter Institute, John Hopkins, UCSD, and at the University of Dresden. 
and they're doing everything from cryo-electron tomography, super-resolution imaging, and omics uh, experiments. So I told you now um, how we set up our simulations for bacteria. As I say, we bring in as much experimental information uh, to provide us with information on kinetics, uh, cell geometry. Uh, we think this is so important. We do that through the basis of the Jupyter notebooks, their Python notebooks uh, called Experiment to LM. Then we build up our systems and we can simulate them either on a cluster or at blue waters. And, uh, and I am also would like to say I'm looking for another programmer to help turn what we're doing for eukaryotic cells into a Minecraft game. Um, and maybe with, if I have a few minutes remaining, I can just show you quickly what we have been doing on the, for eukaryotic cells. So let me end by uh, thanking and mentioning all my collaborators. Um, so James um, is a lipidomics expert at the University of uh, Dresden. And um, Martin and Kate Kipa are members of our Physics Frontier Center, and they've been instrumental in helping us with various experiments. These are my students down here that are now working on the minimal cell. And uh, Zala was a postdoc that led the effort on the HeLa cell. Um, these are the colleagues that are over in uh, the Max Planck Institute. Elizabeth is now at UCSD, and they're providing us with the tomograms. These are very important programmers that help with the BMD visualization, and uh, Julio, who helps us with our lattice microbes code. And these are the colleagues from the Synthetic Biology and Minimal Cell Group at the Greg Venter Institute. Uh, this is Wenmei uh, Wu, who, uh, through his uh, friendship with the uh, uh, Vice President of NVIDIA, helped to bring the first NVIDIA uh, CUDA Center of Excellence to the University of Illinois. And these are former postdocs who worked on either ribosome biogenesis or the minimal cell. Thank you. Thank you. Um, questions? Uh, I have a, a question. Um, if it's uh, the vector of the cell, I assume, would be easiestly related to the origin of DNA replication. So if you place a gene next to the origin or away from the origin that the cell is critically dependent upon in limiting activity, do you see in your dynamics a, a difference in the, the, you know, the levels of RNA and, and even predicted growth in cells? Oh, <clears throat> that's an interesting uh, question. I've been discussing that with the great Venter folks because, you know, they're, uh, the SYN uh, 3A, and you can see how many other versions they had to make to get up to 3A, was based on um, microplasma mycoides. But when they were synthetically developing it, they did have a tendency to move things and not always maintain the original order that they were in in the mycoides. Um, so, uh, now they're going back and I asked them, please put them back in the way that they were because, uh, we were seeing some unusual results and they're working on a paper about this. Uh, so some things that they thought that they had to put back in, maybe they don't. Um, if you have other processes, uh, take over, uh, so that's a very good question, and it was the first thing that I, I was asking them when I saw where they had moved the genes. And that only became really apparent when we started to uh, compare the NCBI entry uh, of the synthetic cell with the original one and realized yeah. that it was moved. Yes, it can have an effect. And particularly, you want to be really careful of those things that are in operons. Like, for example, there's a famous operon that's called the CDW that helps make the cell wall, yeah. you really don't want to mess with that. You mean in terms of moving it? That, yeah, with the gene might be It'll different. Do. Yeah. So we're still looking if, can we even, it has a two hour doubling time, can we improve on that a bit? Because it's, it, in going from the original apparent organism, the doubling time did increase slightly. So uh, we may be able to get that back down. 
are there other questions? Um, I have a question. Oh, okay, Jose. So then, Jose. I'm always curious about your diffusion coefficient there. The cell is a very crowded environment, so you're not diffusing in a sort of open medium. How do you put all these exclude volume and collapse and all these things when you do motion around the cell? Yeah, getting the, the diffusion coefficients. Um, so uh, again, uh, in, in part, we can get those from our experimental collaborators, but I must admit, um, like for ribosome biogenesis, we were lucky in that Johan Elf had actually studied the diffusion of the ribosomes, the small subunit, large subunit, the intact ribosome in a cell. So uh, we had the in-cell diffusion coefficients. Uh, otherwise, uh, the only thing we can do is uh, use, start off with the ones that are in vitro, or like with the messengers, um, what we assumed was, you know, their uh, sort of a random coil, what would be their hydrodynamic uh, radius, and uh, getting an appropriate diffusion coefficient from it. So, you know, we could be wrong. Uh, what we have, what we do is at the end, as they said, we try to compare our production of the proteins. Does it agree with the proteomics? Uh, we, our collaborator, uh, 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 Gonzalez at UCSD, who did it, uh, provided that information for us and is on the eLife paper, he's trying to do it at the single cell level, so we'll have a better feel for that. And as I said, now, uh, there are people are beginning to do uh, RNA-seq and half-life measurements on the messengers. So we were happy, and that's why we really wanted to put in that uh, degradosome, is to get a distribution of times. And we even understand there was one that takes like 14 minutes, but that's been in there from the get-go for the model gram-positive organism bacillus. Uh, in our case, it happens to be a, uh, a very a big transporter. So uh, all we can do, uh, Jose, is check at the end if we have it uh, correct or not. So the, you're right, saying oh, that the, the, so the crowding of the cell comes on an average way. So you have an average diffusion way, the average over the entire crowding. You have to go around all this. Right. Thank okay. you. I, I think we need to move on. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, the next presentation is by Sengjin. Kim, uh, again, at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And uh, it'll be on DNA supercoiling mediating long distance interactions between RNA polymerases. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Seng Jin Kim. I'm a new assistant professor at University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And today I wanna to tell you about immersion group behavior that we saw during transcription. Uh, when single RNA polymerase becomes multiple RNA, RNA polymerases. Uh, so this is the work that I did as a postdoc uh, at uh, Dr. Christian Jacobs Wagner's lab at Yale University. All right, so um, whether we are looking at a simple cell like bacterial cell or more complicated uh, mammalian cells, uh, in the core of the cell there is always genomic DNA and there is this common traffic problem in any kind of genome uh, created by RNA polymerases. So as you can see in this cartoon, um, um, the transcription can be viewed as uh, like cars on a highway, uh, and the traffic can vary depending on the region that you're looking at in the genome, and the speed of these cars can also vary uh, in time and also in space. So, um, we're wondering how the density varies depending on the location of the genome. Uh, so we looked at the RNA polymerase profiling data uh, acquired from E. coli cells. As you can see from this plot along the genome, the density can vary uh, very much uh, depending on the genes and depending on the regions. Uh, the density can vary depending on the space and also in time. So uh, density, can, density of RNA polymerases along a given gene can dynamically change depending on the environment. All right, so we're wondering how this density of RNA polymerases uh, affect the speed of RNA polymerases. Uh, although we know a lot about how this single RNA polymerase uh, works by itself, uh, from beautiful structural biology studies, 
uh, and biochemistry and single molecule studies. What's not still remain unclear is how RNA polymerases work together when they transcribe a single gene at the same time. So how and if and how RNA polymerases influence each other is not very well known. All right, so the prevailing model in the field was based on this push mechanism upon collision that says when two RNA polymerases collide each other, the RNA polymerases RNA polymerase in the back can push the RNA polymerase in the forward, push RNA polymerase in the front forward so that that effectively increase the speed of RNA polymerases. And it's shown to be very effective in increasing the overall speed of RNA polymerases when um, basically RNA polymerases are very dense on the gene. Like, uh, that's for example, in the ribosomal gene case where the RNA polymerases are basically bumper to bumper situation. So that push can uh, begin right from the beginning of transcription and continues to the end of transcription elongation. All right, so one prediction of this push model is that if we dial down um, the density from this bumper to bumper situation, um, the speed of these RNA polymerase should decrease as well. So whether there's a scaling between density and speed is not known, so we wanted to test this prediction. And to test that idea, we use lactose operon in E. coli, which is the paradigm of gene regulation in bacteria. Uh, so in this operon, uh, there is a promoter that is usually repressed by a repressor protein. And we can add an inducer into the culture. The inducer is called IPTG. And then let the lac repressor dissociate and let the transcription to start. And what's nice thing about this uh, system is that we can control the density of RNA polymerases on the gene by using different concentrations of IPTG. And uh, this gene is uh, about three kilobase. Um, and we can um, prove the expression, its transcription level by using uh, more traditional Miller's beta galactoside assay or fluorescence in situ hybridization, which I'm gonna tell you next. Just a small note that all the results that I'm going to tell you today is not really dependent on the subsequent genes, like YANA, because we did a ex control experiment without these genes and saw the same phenomenon. All right, so we use, uh, uh, we basically measured mRNA levels by using fluorescence in situ hybridization. Uh, and because this fish technique is based on fixed cells, uh, we combine this with a time course experiment. Essentially, at time zero, we added IPTG to the cell culture to start transcription. And then at subsequent time points, uh, we sample the cells and fix them right away, and then permeabilize cells and introduce these two sets of probes, the first set binding to the phi prime end of the gene, um, or the beginning of the gene, and the second set of probes binding to the later part of the gene or the end of the gene. So that, uh, and then these two sets of gene, uh, two sets of probes are labeled in different fluorophores so that we can differentiate the subregions of a gene by color. So if I show you the example images, at time zero, uh, E. coli cells do not show any fluorescent signals, and that is because at time zero, it's essentially a repressed state. There is no lactate mRNA. Uh, at one minute after induction, cells start to show the red or phi prime signal, and that indicates that RNA polymerases have loaded to the gene locus and transcribe only the phi prime region. And this signal intensity of the red will increase over time as more RNA polymerases load to the locus. Later time points, we see the green signal or the three prime signal appear on the top of the red. Um, that indicates that the RNA polymerases have moved from five, five prime to three prime region of a gene, of this uh, LACTI gene. All right, so from analyzing thousands of cells at each time point, uh, basically analyzing the fluorescence level from many cells at each time point, we get this very reproducible data showing that five prime uh, signal increases first after time zero and three prime um, signal increase a little later shifted in time from the red. Um, from increase in the five, five prime, we can um, guess the initiation rate, how quickly RNA polymerase is loaded over time. 
And from the shift between red and green, uh, we, can, uh, we can measure the rate of transcription elongation, essentially the speed of RNA polymerases. I'm going to briefly tell you next, but uh, briefly tell you in, in the end, but uh, we can also measure processivity of RNA polymerases from this assay. What we did was we used different concentrations of IPTG at time zero to, uh, how to adjust the transcription initiation or density of RNA polymerases on the gene, and then we measure the rate of transcription elongation as an output. All right, so when we uh, uh, when uh, IPTG uh, decreased from about 1 millimolar to 0.5 millimolar, uh, we saw about fourfold reduction in expression, uh, or about fourfold reduction in density of RNA polymerases. However, the speed of RNA polymerases did not really change within this range. So this uh, is not in good agreement with uh, the push model. Right? So we are wondering whether we are dealing with uh, too few RNA polymerases that the push is not really frequent or the collision is not very frequent. And we basically wanted to compare this regime of density to the other genes um, in E. coli genome. So we used RNA polymerase profiling data um, that was published in 2014. And, um, which tells us, we, and draw this histogram where x-axis is the relative RNA polymerase density in each genes, about there are about 4,000 genes in this graph. Uh, ribosomal genes rank the highest, meaning that RNA polymerases are very dense along ribosomal genes. Repressed genes are ranked low, and that means there are not many RNA polymerases in, this, in these genes. Uh, fully induced LACT is around here, ranked around here, and if we use about full fold reduction in density uh, that we observe in 0.05 millimolar PTG, we can estimate that density of RNA polymerases will be around here. And this is the region where we also uh, saw no scaling between the density and speed. And interestingly, many genes that are essential for cell physiology, and we know that they are well expressed, actually lie in this no scaling regime suggesting that even though RNA polymerase may be far apart and does not affect each other's speed, but it's still physiologically relevant regime of density. All right, so if RNA polymerases do not affect each other's speed, then we thought that probably turning off the promoter should not affect these uh, RNA polymerases' speed either. Um, so I'm talking about promoter turn off because bacteria often live in a fluctuating environment where the inducer can come in and come up uh, and then disappear. And we're wondering what happened to the already loaded RNA polymerases when the promoter gets turned off. So to test this idea, um, we uh, compared two types of experiment. The first type is basically the, the continuous on experiment, where, which I described so far. And then the new experiment type is called pulse experiment. And in this experiment, we uh, added, uh, we basically induced the gene expression at time zero, the same way as in the first experiment. But later on, we turned off the promoter and then let the RNA polymerase finish transcription elongation. And because we know the RNA polymerase uh, takes about two minutes uh, to transcribe this uh, three kilobase uh, DNA, LACZ, we uh, decided to turn off the promoter at about 1.5 minutes after adding induction, so that it's the after adding inducer, so that we can, uh, so that the first RNA polymerase still hasn't finished the transcription of LACZ when we turn off the promoter. All right, so I want to show you some animation illustrating what we initially expected. So this uh, x-axis is the DNA template for LACZ, and here is the promoter. And the promoter opens at time zero, and triangles or the RNA polymerase is load, and they move. Uh, together with the ribosomes in purple. And at 1.5 minutes, the promoter got turned off here, but the already loaded RNA polymerases may just finish transcription at their original speed. And if the situation goes like this, then we would get this kind of fish data where there is five prime and three prime signal uh, in the continuous on experiment. 
And if we do pulse experiment, the five prime and three prime mRNA level should start to decrease because the promoter gets stopped, right? However, the shift between red and green signal should effectively remain the same as the continuous uh, on experiment. However, in actual experiment, this, is, this was not what we observed. Um, this is exper experimental data from continuous induction case. And if we do pulse experiment, um, zero minute and one minute time point uh, mRNA levels were exactly the same as the induction experiment. And they make sense because until these time, until 1.5 minute, the two experimental types are exactly the same. Cells are, in, in, cells are experiencing induction at, uh, until this time, until 1.5 minute. And at two minute time point, we see the reduction of five prime signal. And that means that five, that means that promoter uh, effectively stopped uh, loading more RNA polymerases. But what's really fascinating is that the three prime level still remains at the basal level when we turn off the promoter. And it takes about a minute or so to above, to appear on above the, to appear above the back baseline. And this increase in the shift between red and green signal in the pulse experiment suggests that the RNA polymerase is apparently slow down after we turn off the promoter. So we wanted to basically decouple the speed of RNA polymerase. Uh, for the first 90 seconds, they uh, effectively remain a uh, speed uh, where speed when the promoter is on, remains on. And after 90 seconds, uh, they switch to move slower, but at this a new rate of R off, where the speed of RNA polymerase is after promoter turned off. And when we decouple these two rate, decouple the overall speed into these two rate two states, then we see that R on the promoter when the promoter is on, uh, RNA polymerase effectively runs at about 30 bases per second. But when promoter is turned off, they reduce their speed uh, about five to six fold and they run at about five to six base per second. And this was uh, largely very much a general phenomenon because we saw this phenomenon even though we used the rifampicin to block further initiation. So rifampicin is a, a transcription initiation drug, inhibitor, inhibitor drug. Uh, and this is not really some lag repressor specific. Uh, we saw this phenomenon even though we had this DNA template on the plasmid instead of a chromosome. So it has uh, not really something to do with the chromosomal context. And also we saw this in different growth conditions. And most importantly, we saw this in other genes when we fused a synthetic, uh, inducer, uh, synthetic inducible promoter to genes of different lengths. And what's really uh, fascinating to me is that the first RNA polymerases are very far from the promoter, almost close to the finish line when the promoter is shut off. And it's really interesting how these uh, RNA polymerases can sense what happened at the, what's happening at the promoter and respond uh, and change their speed. And there seems to be some sort of a long range effect from the promoter to this first RNA polymerase. So we thought maybe there is, this phenomenon has something to do with DNA supercooling. This drawing is a tech, uh, from a biochemistry textbook uh, showing uh, the interplay between transcription and DNA supercooling. So it's been well known that during transcription elongation, uh, RNA polymerases basically produce supercooling on the DNA, uh, effectively negative supercooling in the back of the RNA polymerase and positive supercooling in the front of the RNA polymerase. And it's also known that either types of supercool accumulation um, will prevent the motion of these RNA polymerases. And that is because this supercooling can exert a torsional stress on the, on the translocation of the RNA polymerase. All right, so based on this uh, interplay, this interplay between DNA supercooling and transcription, uh, we made this model. Uh, where when RNA polymerase runs by itself, like this solo RNA polymerase, uh, the supercoals may accumulate and make this RNA polymerase to slow down or may, may, make, may make this RNA polymerase to move at slower speed. However, when there are multiple RNA polymerases moving together on the gene at the same time, the supercoals can actually cancel each other because they are opposite signs. 
and the torsional stress does not build up and facilitating the motion of these RA polymerases. The beauty of this cancellation idea is that this cancellation can work even though uh, two RA polymerases are far from each other or low density on the gene because supercoals can diffuse. So this cancellation idea suggests that the speed of RNA polymerase uh, may not be very sensitive to the density of RNA polymerase, as, we, uh, as I showed you in the beginning of the talk. All right, so what, what's going to happen if the promoter is turned off? So according to this uh, supercooling model, if we turn off the promoter, the most promoter proximal RNA polymerase will start to accumulate negative supercooling in the back because there's no new RNA polymerase that can provide positive RNA, positive supercooling for cancellation. And this accumulation will slow down this RNA polymerase. And this RNA polymerase will not make positive supercooling for its downstream neighbor. And accumulation happens for the next RNA polymerase and slow down and so forth and so forth. So the RNA polymerase in the gene can, uh, in this gene can effectively experience torsionally stress mode of transcription elongation. All right, so if this model is true, this, this model is basically um, rely on just DNA that can be supercooled and then RNA polymerases. And we should be able to re recapitulate this um, phenomenon that the RNA polymerase slow down after promoter turn off. If we do experiment in vitro, with just the DNA template uh, that can be supercooled and RNA polymerases. So we conducted in vitro transcription experiment. And in this in vitro setting, we can also turn off the promoter by adding a rifampicin at a certain time point to block further loading of RNA polymerases on the DNA template. All right, so even in vitro, we saw that if we turn off the promoter by rifampicin, the speed of E. coli RNA polymerase uh, greatly uh, reduces, it slows down um, as well, also in vitro. And super cool thing about the in vitro transcription is that we can use linear DNA as a template. And in the linear DNA, the ends are free to rotate. Um, so that uh, any kind of super cool accumulation can be basically released or diffused out of the out from the ends, dissipate, dissipate from the end. So when we linearize this plasmid and conducted the same transcription experiment, then we saw no reduction in speed even we turn even after we turn off the promoter. So this strongly support the idea that the the um, slow down after uh, repression has something to do with the torsional stress building up. All right, so we have this working model where RNA polymerases basically uh, exhibit group behavior. Uh, when they can cancel each other's speed, uh, they can collaborate and facilitate each other's uh, motion. When they cannot do cancellation and then instead the supercodes accumulate, then they can effectively negatively affect each other and slow down all together. And one prediction of this model is for the case of single RNA polymerase. If RNA polymerase works by itself, then it should exhibit slower speed because there is no cancellation, right? And I'm gonna skip the details, but when we lower the IPTG even further and allow only one RNA polymerase uh, to be loaded on the gene, we saw that R on is actually slower. Uh, it was 20 instead of 30. And then um, the R on and R off were similar in that situation. So this switch-like behavior um, during transcription elongation is truly a group behavior instead of, um, and that's different from a single line polymerase. All right, so what's the benefit of slowing down after repression? Uh, because speed is often related to termination efficiency of transcription, we are wondering if the processivity has anything to do with it. So we measured processivity from fish data. From continuous on experiment, we saw the five prime level is almost same as three prime level, indicating that most of the RNA polymerases that made five prime reached three prime side, almost 100% processivity. However, when we do pulse experiment, the three prime level is only the half of five prime, indicating that almost 50% of RNA polymerases did not make it to the three prime side. 
So apparently there seemed to be some sort of premature dissociation happening after promoter repression. We observe the same phenomenon even in vitro when we turn off the promoter in vitro uh, during in vitro transcription. Uh, the three prime level uh, of uh, mRNA was uh, much lower than five prime from torsional restraint template. However, if you see the linear DNA template case, um, the three prime level is almost similar to the five prime level, indicating that this um, um, difference in three prime and five prime from termination from premature termination is also something to do with the torsional stress of the DNA. All right, so I, so far I told you about the interaction between RNA polymerases within a gene, but in the genome scale, there can be uh, neighboring genes, uh, there, there can be another gene nearby, and RNA polymerases from that gene can also affect the gene um, from, they can also, um, affect each other. Basically, RNA polymerase from two different genes can affect each other. Uh, and it, especially in a divergent gene uh, case examples, we expect the negative spurcolamine will accumulate in the intergenic region and negatively affect um, each other's uh, translocation dynamics. So we tested this idea uh, by constructing this, uh, these uh, constructs where we added a random gene like GFP upstream of LACZ, and we saw only when the GFP is strongly expressed in this darker green case, um, the RNA polymerase is running on the LACZ uh, exhibits slower speed, uh, confirming that idea. And this uh, interaction between two separate genes continued even though the two genes are about 2.5 kilobase apart. So this has some, um, implications to the genome biology that uh, RNA polymerases from two different genes can also negatively affect each other. All right, so this is a take-home message that uh, due to the interplay between transcription and DNA supercooling, we saw that RNA polymerases work better together in cells best interest. Uh, as a group, they can exhibit faster speed when the promoter is on, but when the promoter is turned off, they can actually slow down tremendously, and actually some of them, some of that implements can be uh, dissociate, can dissociate. And this is a great mechanism to break, uh, to exert a break on the protein synthesis when the cells do not, no longer need to make proteins. All right, so this was the work done during my postdoc at Yale with Dr. Jacobs Wagner, and you can check more details from this paper from last year. And I'm going to briefly tell you about my work in, at your University of Illinois. So in my lab, we try to combine in vitro single molecule experiments and in vivo single molecule, uh, single cell imaging and computational and theoretical modeling to, to better understand the mechanism of the group behavior. So for example, we are trying to use in vitro experiment to find the physical mechanism uh, by um, measuring the spatial temporal dynamics of DNA supercooling, basically how far and how fast they diffuse and propagate, and measure the DNA supercooling and RNA polymerase dynamics at the same time in real time at the single molecule level. I already started collaborating with a theoretical physicist to have a theory on this phenomenon. Although it's preliminary, the theory of the, the the theory already predicts the experimental observation that um, there is this unique pattern of um, speed that depends on the density of RNA polymerases. Okay, so with that, I would like to thank all of you and um, with my, my, my collaborator at University of Illinois. And we are actively looking for new uh, research uh, scientists uh, working in our lab. I also want to thank NSF for giving uh, funding for uh, my first microscope setup in the lab. And I'm ready for questions. Thank you. Uh, questions? Uh, I just would uh, make the observation, which I'm sure you're aware of, that in mammalian cells, now we picture all, most of the transcription as being a burst where multiple polymerases move together uh, down the DNA. 
And uh, the clustering of polymerases by that model would be totally consistent with your, your model in terms of the compensation of uh, tandem dupe, uh, polymerases. Are there other questions? If not, then I, I think we need to uh, move to the next presentation by uh, Aris Dror, who's at UCLA, on excess mediates unique mechanisms of X chromosome dosage compensation in early human development. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm a postdoc in uh, the Plathas lab. Uh, and today I'm going to show you our project that was done together with two uh, graduate students in the lab, Anna and Satne. Uh, and this project really started from our attempt of exploring the role of the non-coding -non RNA exist, which you can see here in green, in the formation of a repressive nuclear compartment during the human. And it ended up in finding um, a very surprising observations regarding the fundamental principles of exist spreading, uh, which I'm going to show to you today. So, um, as you all know, um, a million females have two X chromosomes, while male only have one X chromosome and Y Y chromosome. Um, so, in order to prevent double dosage of X-linked genes. Uh, mammalian females developed a unique mechanism uh, of dosage compensation called X chromosome inactivation or XCI in short, um, in which one of the two X chromosomes undergo inactivation. And this results in similar gene expression of X linked genes in males and females. Now, as you can imagine, this very complex uh, process of uh, the silencing of full chromosome is a complex process and interestingly it is mediated by a long known coding RNA called EXIST. Now EXIST is expressed from one of the two X chromosomes. It is silenced in the other chromosome. Uh, it is then exploit the three-dimensional structure of the uh, chromosome to spread in cis and to cover the entire X chromosome. Um, and this really causes the compaction of that chromosome and the silencing of uh, those genes. Now here's how it's, uh, it looks like in imaging. So here you can see in green a uh, painting of the two X chromosome, uh, which you can see uh, here and here. Uh, and in pink you can see um, the RNA of EXIST, a fish of the uh, EXIST RNA. Uh, and you can see that EXIST is covering uh, one of the two Xs, and this leads to the formation of a repressive nuclear compartment. Now, all of these uh, functions make EXIST an excellent model to study the role of long non coding RNAs in regulation of uh, gene expression and in chromatin structure. So, uh, recently it has been discover, discovered that um, early during embryonic development, there is a different mechanism of dosage compensation that is unique to human, where uh, instead of expression of exist from one chromosome, as we can see during XCI, which you can see here, at the pre-implantation state, exist is expressed from both chromosomes, as you can see here. However, even though that exist is expressed, we don't see uh, an inactivation of the X, we don't see silencing of the X. Instead, both X, Xs uh, show down regulation, but again, not silencing um, of gene expression. And this um, process is called X chromosome dampening, or XCD in short. So it is not clear that there are two different mechanisms of dosage compensation, XCI that takes place post-implantation, and XCD that takes place uh, during the pre-implantation. And these two mechanisms are uh, mechanistically different. Now this uh, led us to um, the first question which we wanted to check, which is whether EXIST, which is the master regulator of XCI, uh, also regulate gene expression uh, during uh, XCD. So to test that, uh, Tzatni from the lab uh, did a knockout 
of exist in cell undergoing XED, uh, following by RNA seq to check that gene expression changes upon the knockout, uh, which you can see here. And you can see that upon exist knockout, X linked genes are up regulated. Uh, and this suggests that indeed exist has a role in regulating gene expression during XCD. Um, so this was really interesting for us uh, because even though that exist has high expression levels, as you can see here in the pink, uh, and similar isoforms uh, in somatic cells undergoing XCI and in the XCD, uh, its expression can lead to two different output of dosage compensation in the somatic and the pre-implantation cells. So in order to further understand how one long non-coding RNA can cause these two different output of expression of X-linked genes, the first thing we wanted to check was whether EXIST has similar binding on the DNA during XED and XCI. So, um, to test where and whether exist binds to the DNA, we used a method called RAPSIC. Uh, this method was developed by Mitchell's Gutman lab. Um, and I like to describe this method as a modified chip seq where instead of looking for the genomic binding site of a protein of interest, we're going to check the binding site along the DNA for an RNA of interest, which is in our case is exist. So uh, Anna did uh, RAPSIC in two different cell types undergoing XCD. Comparison, she also did RAPSIC in cells undergoing, uh, somatic cells undergoing XCI. And of course, we have replication for each, all uh, showing high reproducibility. Uh, and this is what we found. So here I'm showing the localization of exist um, along the X chromosome. In dark and light blue, I'm showing uh, two different cells, cell types undergoing XCD. Uh, and in green, and as a comparison, uh, somatic cells undergoing XCI. And as you can see in XCD here and here, exist localizes across the entire X chromosome, where above than 88% of the windows showed enrichment of more than two folds compared to the uh, input. And this really is very similar to the to exist localization in the somatic cells undergoing XCI. Uh, of course, uh, uh, next, uh, so next we wanted to see whether it is the binding of exist on the DNA that is responsible for the downregulation of gene expression. Uh, so we took the RAPSIC data and we divided it into three, um, three groups. Uh, genomic regions showing low exist uh, localization, and this is the left side of the x-axis, uh, medium exist localization or high exist localization. And we checked whether uh, the, and we checked the changes in gene expression between the cells expressing the exist and the knockout. And you can see that genes that were found in uh, regions with low exist localization show no changes in gene expression, um, meaning that they're not regulated by exist. Uh, while genes that were found in region uh, in which exist showed up regulation uh, upon exist knockout. And this really suggests that it is exist binding to the DNA uh, that has a role in the dampening of X-linked genes. Uh, so it, it seems um, that uh, indeed also during XCD, uh, during embryo early embryonic development, exist can bind to the DNA uh, across the entire X chromosome, and uh, this causes a downregulation of X-linked genes. However, when we looked at the autosomes, we found something very surprising. So uh, it is widely uh, known or appreciated in the field that exist binds only to the X chromosome from which it is transcribed. Uh, and indeed, when we looked at exist peaks, uh, binding peaks uh, along the DNA uh, in cells undergoing XCI here in green, we found that less than 1% of the peaks were found in autosomes as we expected. Um, however, in cells undergoing XCD, which you can see here in blue, we found that about 40 to 60% of the peaks of exist were found on autosomes. Um, where here I'm showing the peaks um, along um, all of the autosomes. And you can see here on the top uh, peaks in chromosome X, and you can see that both uh, XCD in blue 
and uh, XCI in green exist is in region across the entire X chromosome. Uh, and in comparison to that, and this is unique to cells undergoing XCD, uh, here again in blue, uh, you can see that exists also bind across uh, the autosomes. Uh, and here I'm showing an example for that. Uh, so here I'm showing a zoom in to a short region in chromosome six, and you can see that is uh, there is an enrichment of exist localization in all of the cells undergoing X, all of the cells and replicates uh, uh, undergoing XCD, uh, but there is no binding of exist in cell undergoing XCI in green. And this really complements what we see using imaging uh, approaches. Where here on the left, I'm showing cells undergoing XCD, on the right, cells undergoing XCI, and in green, you can see a uh, fish of exist RNA. And you can see that the cloud of exist during uh, XCD is much more dispersed and punctuated uh, compared to, what, to the cloud in XCI. And this was very uh, exciting for us because as far as we know, this is the first time where we see endogenous uh, expression of exist that result in, in binding to autosomes. So of course we wanted to see whether similar to the uh, X chromosome, the binding of exist to autosome can also cause the down regulation of genes. Uh, and we found 102 genes, uh, autosomal genes in region enriched in exist uh, and we compared their gene expression between cells expressing exist and the exist knockout. Uh, and we found that uh, also autosomal genes that are enriched in exist show uh, upregulation in their gene expression uh, upon exist uh, knockout. And this suggests that not only exist can bind to autosomes, but it has a functional role there. Uh, and here I'm showing such an example for that. And you can see that uh, 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 the gene hung here uh, on chromosome 21. And in blue, you can see exist localization in cells undergoing XCD again. And you can see that exist is spread uh, above this, uh, over this gene. Uh, well, uh, in cells undergoing XCI, we don't see uh, localization above this gene. In here uh, below, you can see this gene expression, and you can see that in the exist uh, knockout here in gray, uh, there, are, there are higher uh, expression of these genes compared to the cells expressing exist. Um, so just to summarize everything, we found that uh, exist seems to also regulate this unique mechanism of dosage compensation during early embryonic development. And what was the most surprising for us is that during XCD, before the compartment of the XI is formed, XCD is able to spread beyond the X territory and bind to autosomes. And this is really exciting for us because it uh, provides us an experimental system to really study what I think is one of the most fascinating question in the field, which is why in the somatic cells exist doesn't leave the X territory from which it is transcribed. So um, I would like to end by presenting to you our model of why we think that exist expression can cause this, cause this two different mode of gene expression. So even though that uh, exist expression is similar between the somatic cells and uh, during early embryonic development, the spreading of exist beyond the X in XCD causes a, a local concentration of exist on the X to be lower in XCD compared to the XCI. And we, see that, we think that this reduced lo local localization might have a role uh, or might affect or might cause dampening instead of silencing. And what we're trying to understand now is what are the factors that prevent exist from spreading beyond the X territory during XCI? Um, so I would like to thank uh, Anna and Satni shown here and the rest of the Plath Lab and of course, all of you guys for listening. And I will be taking questions, I think. Thank you. Um, are there uh, questions? Uh, Rick? That was a beautiful presentation. And I, uh, it made me wonder if you think that in XCD, 
pre-implantation. Uh, it's very similar to the kinds of dosage compensation that C. elegans undergoes. That's a really good question. Uh, we, I haven't thought about it. Um, I need to think about it. That's. It, it, it distinguishes itself because you get repression of both of the female X's by half. And so it looks like, at least at this stage of human pre-implantation development, you may get something that has the same evolutionary features that, um, that C. elegans has at that stage. Yeah. Thanks. Um, there's a question on chat. Uh, is there any difference between the K27 methylation program between genes regulated in the two uh, different stages of excess uh, silencing? Um, so this is something we are currently checking. Um, uh, there definitely might be some differences, uh, but we're, we're checking it now. Thank you. Um, one of the questions that I would have, um, you showed on autosomals uh, silencing specific regions that were being affected and flanking sequences were not. Um, were you able to identify any particular property of those regions, uh, long genes, short genes, uh, promoter density, or whatever that, that yeah. would... Um, possibly explain that? So that's, I think that's for me is one of the most fascinating questions about this. So we know that it goes to more uh, uh, gene rich regions. Um, we think it's the A compartment um, and it looks like it's spread more over, even though it's gene rich re active region, it's spread more over lowly expressed genes. Um, yeah, so we think it's somewhat of a similar mechanism to how it spread over the over the X, um, but we're still checking it. Have you been able to show co-localization of those regions uh, to the more dense region of excess in the in the cell? What do you mean, show like by using in C two probes to different autosomal regions yeah, yeah. Uh, so we have we have some, they are proximal in the in that stage yeah so we have some uh, imaging for that um, uh, and we do see some regions that are close to the axis locus um, the thing is that unlike the X um, it seems like in different single cell it might go to uh, slightly different regions so it doesn't always go in one cell to all of these regions so depending on the single cell it might go to different uh, regions mm -hmm. um, oh yes we can have a nice conversation here <laughs> so uh, i'll ask another uh, question many uh, proteins with intrinsic disorder domains and slightly basic regions uh, will concentrate with RNA in uh, what is called condensate type uh, active regions in the, in the nucleus. Um, are there any indications of specific concentration of polycomb related proteins or other okay. silencing proteins in that region? So I love this question. Uh, Amy uh, from the lab uh, is going to give a presentation later on today that discuss exactly this thing. So stay okay. tuned. We don't want to take her, yeah. take her uh, message. <laughs> Spoil it. Okay. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, very nice talk. Thank you very much. Uh, the next presentation is by uh, Claudio Mimoso, who's at Harvard Medical School and will speak on the rapid and efficient co-transcriptional splicing enhances mammalian gene expression. Claudio.
everyone. My name is Claudia Mimoso and I am a graduate student in the Edelman lab and today I'm going to be talking about a collaborative project between our lab and Carla Nagenbauer's lab at Yale University looking at rapid and efficient co-transcriptional splicing and how this enhances mammalian gene expression. On average, mammalian pre-mRNAs contain eight long introns and shorter exons. Introns whose boundaries are marked by the five prime and three prime splice site are removed from pre-mRNAs by a complex called the spliceosome. Several independent reports have shown that most introns are removed co-transcriptionally, ranging from 75% in humans to 87% in Drosophila. The spliceosome is required to remove introns of different lengths and also multiple introns per transcript in order for the proper processing of pre-mRNAs. Failures in RNA processing can result in aberrant transcripts, which would encode homologous proteins if they were to engage with the ribosome. So since splicing occurs largely co-transcriptionally, the substrate for splicing is constantly changing its 3' end position, its sequence, potential secondary structure, and available RNA binding proteins. Previous work has investigated the coordination between splicing and transcription machineries, where we've noted that the presence of introns can stimulate transcription, but the mechanisms are largely unknown. Also, that altering the rate of PAL2 elongation has been shown to impact splicing outcomes. However, the spatial and temporal relationship between splicing and transcription still remains poorly unknown. Altogether, there are a number of unanswered questions about co-transcriptional splicing. First being, where is PAL2 when splicing occurs? Previous work in Carla's lab in yeast has shown that PAL2 is relatively close to the 3' splice site when splicing is able to occur. The next being, does PAL2 pause near splice junctions? Previous reports have disagreed on the behavior of RNA PAL2 near splice junctions, with some studies indicating long-lived pausing at the 5' and 3' splice sites, with others noting moderate or no significant changes in RNA PAL2 elongation. Thus, the baseline behavior of PAL2 at splice sites and whether splicing efficiency impinges on transcription elongation is still an unanswered question in the field. The last question that I want to address is how does splicing impact 3' end formation? So for example, previous work in Carla's lab in yeast has suggested a correlation between splicing efficiency and 3' end processing. So to tackle these questions, Carla and her graduate student Kirsten Reimer had asked us to collaborate on a project to investigate the spatial and temporal window for splicing and its relationship to RNA PAL2 elongation in mammals. Erythropoiesis was selected as a model system to study co-transcriptional splicing in mammals as changes in cell morphology are correlated with changes in gene expression, for example, including the upregulation of genes such as globin. So marine erythroleukemic cells, or MEL cells, were treated with 2% DMSO for five days to induce erythropoiesis. Untreated and DMSO-treated MEL cells were subject to long root sequencing, where Kirsten enriched for nascent RNAs by purifying chromatin-associated RNAs and subsequently depleting polyadenylated and ribosomal RNAs. From this, she generated sequencing libraries, which were subject to PacBio long root sequencing. So to first give you an idea of what the data looks like, so for this example gene shown here, each horizontal line indicates a different long read. And we see a variety of different species where, for example, long reads, where all of the introns have been spliced, for example, in, these, in this dark purple, to long reads where the introns are all unspliced, for example, shown in gold. To calculate a range of splicing efficiencies observed in our data, we calculated a per-gene co-transcriptional splicing efficiency metric which I will refer to as COSC. -co we define this as the number of spliced introns divided by the number of spliced and unspliced introns per gene. And we observe a wide range of COSC values in our data set. So in the example gene I have shown on this slide, it's a relatively high COSC in both conditions to also genes that show much lower. 
When we look genome-wide, we find that a majority of introns are spliced co-transcriptionally in induced and uninduced conditions. And we find a similarly high per-gene CoSC between the two conditions investigated, which prompted, us, which prompted us to merge the two datasets for downstream splicing analysis. So the first question, how soon after Paul 2 transcribes a 3' splice site can splicing occur? With a single nucleotide resolution of long read sequencing, we are able to measure this distance in nucleotides as the distance between the 3' end of each long read to the nearest splice junction. And through long read sequencing, we find that similar to yeast, splicing in mammals can occur soon after RNA-Pol2 has transcribed the intron, where we observe that 50% of splicing events, 50% of introns are spliced within 142 nucleotides of transcribing the three prime splice site. Interestingly, the distance, this distance is actually shorter for protein coding genes than it is for non-coding genes. One explanation for the relatively short distances that we are observing between splice junctions and Paul 2 may be because Paul 2 pauses downstream of the splice site to allow time for splicing to occur. Thus, to, to evaluate changes in Paul 2 elongation in relation to splicing, I had performed precision run on sequencing, short for ProSeq, to complement the long read data generated by Carla and Kirsten. So ProSeq allows for single nucleotide resolution mapping of engaged RNA Paul 2 complexes through the transcriptional incorporation of a single bulky biotin NTP. The biotin addicts of which can be bound to beads and to isolate nascent RNAs. Comparing ProSeq to LSR is advantageous because ProSeq data provides an independent measure of nascent RNA 3' ends that come from an actively transcribed polymerase and not originating from other chromatin-associated intermediates. While RNA is fragmented in ProSeq, making reads relatively short, average of 50 nucleotides, we actually detect a number of ProSeq reads that contain splice junctions. Altogether, this data confirms that mammalian splicing can occur when actively engaged Paul 2 is just downstream of the 3' splice site. Thus, two complementary methods to probe Paul 2 position and splicing status indicate that splicing can occur in close proximity to the 3' splice site. We next use ProSeq to determine if transcription elongation changes across intron exon boundaries. As expected, metagene plots around active TSSs, transcription start sites, reveal prominent promoter proximal pausing. Accordingly, ProSeq signal around the 5' and 3' splice sites show no evidence of pausing and no significant changes in RNA Paul 2 elongation. And this also holds true for introns that are that have different splicing efficiencies. The lack of altered elongation rates across splice junctions indicates that RNA Paul 2 elongation is not generally impacted by the transcription of splice sites and confirms that mammalian spliceosomes can act rapidly. We next wanted to look at exceptions to this rule of fast splicing, and that being in the case of detecting splicing intermediates. So, what do I mean by splicing intermediates? Splicing is a two-step reaction. After the first step of splicing, you generate two intermediates, one of which, which is highlighted in red, is compatible with the addition of sequencing adapters and has been reported to be found in chromatin-associated RNA approaches. So interesting, we also, as what's interesting to note is that we, of course, also identify splicing intermediates, but what's unique is that we detect splicing intermediates at a subset of introns. They're not found everywhere. Uh, so for example, here I have four genes shown that you see that at specific introns, they accumulate this high count of intermediates. We next wanted to ask, well, what features are specific to introns with these accumulated splicing intermediates? And to do this, we generated another metric called normalized intermediate count, where we take into account the intermediate count divided by intermediate and splice counts per intron. We then binned all unique introns based on their observed NIC value and calculated the splice site strength of introns in each bin. 
And what we see is that introns that accumulate splicing intermediates have weaker three prime splice sites. We also separated the proseq data by intron NIC values and looked at proseq density across splice sites. And we observed no significant changes in PAL2 density around splice sites in any NIC category. Thus, we conclude that splicing does not feed back on PAL2 elongation, regardless of how efficiently an intron is spliced, but that introns with weak three prime splice sites can cause a delay between the catalytic steps of splicing. So I next want to focus on the opportunities that the data set and our model system has provided to us. So this data set, when looking at erythropoiesis, gives us the opportunity to look at the expression of endogenous globin genes under their physiologically relevant condition during erythropoiesis. And as I mentioned previously, the globin genes, such as beta globin, which I have shown on this slide, are highly transcribed in differentiated MEL cells, uh, noted as induced. And what I want to highlight is that LSR reveals that not only are globin genes upregulated in induced mouse cells, as indicated by the increase in long breeds corresponding to the globin genes, but a significant portion of these long breeds retain all of their introns, noted in gold, and do not undergo cleavage at the canonical gene end, suggesting that under physiologically relevant conditions, a significant fraction of globin gene transcripts are all unspliced and all inefficiently cleaved. To look at this at a genome-wide scale, Kirsten had categorized her reads as undergoing a splicing event as spliced or undergoing no splicing events as unspliced. And what we see is that all unspliced reads have higher read coverage past the gene end, suggesting a functional link between splicing and 3 prime end cleavage. To now test this mechanistically, we took advantage of, a, of the integrated human, of a mouse cell line with an integrated copy of the human beta globin mini gene. Using this system, Kirsten had introduced a thalassemia patient-derived mutation that introduces an alternative three prime splice site. And when I, I want to highlight that the usage of this alternative three prime splice site generates a beta globin mRNA with an in-frame stop codon, and this results in a 90% reduction in functional uh, beta globin protein. We next asked whether or not this thalassemia-causing mutation results in any changes in the overall levels of beta globin splicing. And I want to highlight, as I mentioned on the previous slide, is that the endogenous mouse beta globin has relatively low splicing efficiency after induction. And this is also seen at the beta globin mini gene. So interestingly, what we see is that after introducing this patient-derived mutation is that we see an increase in splicing of intron 1 and that this had a cooperative effect on increasing the splicing of intron 2. This overall increase in splicing efficiency also led to more efficient cleavage of the transcript as we saw less read density past the three prime end. This finding altogether highlights a previously underappreciated level of crosstalk between splicing efficiency within a gene and downstream poly A cleavage. So with that, I'd like to wrap up with the three main conclusions that I told you about today. The first being that we see rapid and efficient co-transcriptional splicing in mammalians. The second is that we see a splicing stall after step one at introns with weak three prime splice sites. And the third being that we see inefficient splicing inhibits three prime end cleavage. So with that, I'd like to thank Karen and all the members of the Edelman Lab for their guidance and support, and many, many thanks to Carla and Kirsten for asking us to collaborate on this project with them. It's been a really great experience working um, with them and tackling these questions. So I'd like to thank you for your attention, and yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, very nice. Uh, <clears throat> questions? Um, Oh, I have a question. Um, the uh, when you uh, uh, looked for the three prime hydroxy and you found it at certain introns, 
and you correlate that with weak three prime splice sites, that to me is quite surprising because we know that the three prime splice site and the five prime appear to communicate with one another during the initial stages of formation of the spliceosome, at least in vitro. And um, why it then should, re, you know, reduce the rate of, of execution of the second step, uh, even though it's in this complex of 50, 70 proteins is, is quite surprising. Yeah, also surprising to us too, for exactly the same uh, thing that you noted is that step one happens after recognition of the three prime splice site. So that too, we're not really sure of, but is what we observed. Um, the run through of the unspliced RNA at the three prime end, um, when you induce globin in this system, uh, is, is, is also very surprising. I know Carla has, has uh, described that as splicing. Um, we have no idea what those unspliced RNAs are um, and unpolyadenylated. Do you have any idea if they're polyadenylated? Because that seems to be a very early step in, in directing the RNA into the spliceosome system. Um, yeah, so we, um, that's a great question. We don't have, um, cause based on the two assays that we did, long read sequencing and ProSeq, we, um, those two assays don't measure the level of polyadenylation, but that's something to know and to potentially look into. Good. Do you know if you see those same RNAs in uh, erythrocytes in, in, um, in steady people? state? What? In steady state? Yeah. In, yeah, no. Not in tumor cell lines, not in tumor cell lines, in primary tissue. Um, that I do not know, but I can double check that. Okay. Uh, other questions? Richard Young had his hand up. Oh, Rick? Hi, Claudia. That was very interesting. Do you have uh, any mechanistic hypothesis regarding why inefficient splicing would have this impact on three prime formation? Not, not like fully. Um, I think there are a few things that could potentially be happening. Um, one thing that I'd be interested also to see is basically we have talk about U1 and how that can potentially inhibit um, either premature termination um, or really impacting faulty elongation. So I'd be maybe an asset that could be that U1 is there, but other components of the spliceosome is not. Um, but if that kind of answers your question. Yeah, just curious how you're thinking about it. Yeah. Are there other questions? Oh, the question comes out of chat is, um, uh, but does Paul to pulse to allow splicing as has been described before? And I think you answered that uh, no. Um, yeah, the answer is no, no indication. Are there any rare introns that do pulse or pulse that you've, if you look at the extremes, you, you don't see a... No, um, really the instances where we kind of see a pause was really being derived from bleed through signal um, from introns that are very close to the TSS. Um, yep. So yeah, really a lot of it was just bleed through. Okay. I think we should go on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the next presentation uh, was mentioned earlier, uh, and this is uh, Amy Panda Jones from UCLA, uh, who will talk on the protein assembly, a protein assembly mediates excess location and gene silencing. Uh, uh, Amy? Hello, my name is Amy Pandia Jones, and I'm a postdoc in the lab of Catherine Plath at the University of California, Los Angeles. And I'm really pleased to be here today to talk to you about work that we've been doing on the long non coding RNA EXIST. Now, EXIST regulates X chromosome inactivation, which is the process by which one of the two X chromosomes in female cells is uh, 
silenced transcriptionally for the lifetime of the cell. Now, in order to understand how EXIST was functioning, I'm going to describe some observations that were interesting to us about EXIST biology. So, uh, EXIST is a long non-coding RNA that's expressed off the X chromosome to silence the chromosome upon which it's expressed. And to do this, EXIST localizes in close spatial proximity to the transcription locus, as you can see here in this high resolution fish image. Now, because EXIST doesn't diffuse through the nucleus, it seems to localize at high concentration and it binds a high set of, a set of diffusible proteins to achieve X chromosome inactivation. Now, there's an additional observation that was intriguing to us, which is that during the initiation of X chromosome inactivation, EXIST seems to become dispensable for continued gene silencing. So, as initiation is um, beginning upon the differentiation of embryonic stem cells, EXIST levels rise, and they're maintained throughout the lifetime of the cell. And EXIST spreading across the X chromosome then instates excellent gene silencing of the genes on that X chromosome. Now, experimentally, if during the initiation process you delete EXIST, what we find is that the genes remain silenced. So these observations led us to two main questions. The first is, how is EXIST localization regulated? And the second is, how is the epigenetic memory of gene silencing achieved? So to get at this, we turn to the proteins that bind EXIST. And with my background in RNA processing, I was particularly interested in a subset of the factors which are known to be well-characterized uh, well RNA splicing and RNA processing proteins. And these include PTBP1, Matron3, TDP43, and SELF1. And surprisingly, despite their uh, well-defined characteristics in processing RNA, they had no known function in X chromosome inactivation. And our initial observations showed that upon their depletion, we found little effect on exist abundance. We found they had little effect on exist splicing, and in fact, they seem to have very little effect on, the, on excellent gene silencing during the exist dependent phase of X chromosome inactivation. So to get at what these proteins might be doing, we first found where they bind on EXIST. And as you can see here, um, these CLIP-seq traces show you that they mostly bind the E-repeat of EXIST. Now the E-repeat is one of six elements within the EXIST RNA that is composed of multiple tandem repeats. And it's thought that these repeated elements function as binding sites for proteins to confer function on the EXIST RNA. So in order to find out what the E-repeat was doing, we deleted it in female embryonic stem cells, which contained two X chromosomes. Now, X chromosome inactivation is random. That means it can be initiated on either of the two, exist, uh, two X chromosomes. And so EXIST, which, in, which uh, initiates X chromosome inactivation and is the master regulator of this process, it can be upregulated on either of the two chromosomes. So to follow which chromosome was being in inactivated, we tagged EXIST with an MS2 tag on one of the two alleles, and we deleted the E-repeat on that allele. We then differentiated these female embryonic stem cells to initiate X chromosome inactivation. And what we found early during the initiation process was in fact that there seemed to be no difference between wild type and delta E exist in their, its ability to spread across the X chromosome, as you can see here in these fish images. This finding was um, corroborated by uh, RAP, which is a uh, high throughput a genomics approach to mapping where a chromatin associated RNA is binding to chromatin. And so as you can see here in these RAP traces, EXIST seems to be able to spread across the X chromosome during the early stages of X chromosome inactivation in the presence or in the absence of the E-repeat. So it seems that EXIST does not need the E-repeat for the very early stages of spreading across the X chromosome, but strikingly when we looked later during initiation, we found that the ability of EXIST in the absence of the E-repeat to remain tightly associated with the X chromosome it was severely compromised. And what we can, and you can see that here where we quantified the number of cells with an exist cloud that was being expressed from the MS2 tagged allele. And as you can see here, wild type cells tend to choose the MS2 allele about 80% of the time. And this was true in Delta E cells as well. 
where initially they were the exist uh, in the absence of the ear repeat was able to form a, an exist cloud that then became very dispersed over time. Now, because exist is important for silencing the X chromosome, and because it seemed that in the absence of the ear repeat, exist was able to function early in initiation, we asked whether silencing was compromised later in initiation. And in fact, in wild type cells that have been differentiated for seven days, you have uh, faithful X chromosome inactivation in which exist here in white is coating the inactive X chromosome and the X linked genes as expected are being expressed from the active X chromosome. However, in the absence of the ear repeat, what we find is that the exist um, transcripts are not able to maintain their association with the X chromosome and consequently X linked gene expression is observed off of the chromosome coated by exist, and these cells actually have now bioallelic gene expression, which is indicative of failure of X chromosome inactivation. And when we quantified this, you see in wild type cells, an increase in the proportion of cells that express the X-linked genes only from the active X chromosome and not from both X chromosomes here as shown in the dark color. But in Delta E cells, what we found over time was that while Delta E exist tried to silence the X chromosome upon which it was being expressed, uh, there seemed to be a failure in silencing, as you can see here, later on during the initiation process. And indeed, this was true of every X-linked gene we looked at. So it seems that the ear repeat is actually important to maintain X-linked gene silencing later during what we defined as the exist independent phase of X chromosome inactivation. So then to ask whether the proteins that bind the e-repeat are required for this function, we took advantage of the MS2 hairpin that we had inserted on exist. And we asked if you have the, MS the e repeat, you have these proteins binding and perhaps they confer function on exist. If you delete the e repeat, these proteins can now no longer bind. You have a loss of exist retention and a reactivation of X-linked genes. So now, if we can recruit these e-repeat binding proteins to the MS2 hairpin via the MS2 co coat protein system, can we restore X-linked X -linked, uh, gene silencing and, rest and uh, localization of exist on the X chromosome? So what I'm showing you here is fish images of exist in wild type cells after day seven of differentiation, and you see the nice exist cloud forming. In the absence of the e-repeat, the cloud becomes very dispersed and excellent gene silencing is not maintained. When we now express full-length PTBP1 that can be recruited to exist in the absence of the e repeat via the MS2 hairpins, indeed we can rescue exist cloud formation, which we quantified here, and you can see this is almost back to wild type levels. And in fact, if you express matron 3, TDP43, or self1, you can rescue at wild type levels. And, and um, Correlating with this, we also can rescue x linked gene silencing by expressing these proteins. So that was nice for us to see that, in fact, the proteins we identified as binding the e-repeat are conferring function on the e-repeat to make sure that X chromosome inactivation faithfully continues beyond the very initial stages of exist spreading and very early stages of transcriptional gene silencing. However, because these four proteins were required, or, or seem to be required, uh, we wanted to test whether this was indeed true. So we know that PTBP1 and matron 3 have a direct interaction in cells, and so we took advantage of known mutations that interfere with their direct interaction. So here I'm showing you wild type cells again after day seven of differentiation with a nice exist cloud. And now when we express a P version of PTBP1 that is mutated here at amino acid 247 such that it cannot directly interact with matron 3. What we find is actually the cloud cannot be rescued, which is quantified here. And if you make the converse mutation in matron 3, where matron 3 cannot interact with PTBP1, we see that similarly it cannot rescue exist localization. And these two mutants can also not rescue X linked gene silencing. So this data showed us that PTBP1 and matron 3 do not act redundantly in this process. And in fact, you need both proteins and it seems that you need the direct interaction between these proteins in order to rescue X-linked gene silencing and X chromosome inactivation. And in data, I don't have time to show you, 
additional experiments indicated that all four factors are required for this process. And so this led us to believe that these four proteins are binding the e-repeat and co-recruiting each other to form an assembly on the e-repeat. Now, to understand how this assembly was functional, we went through many, many experiments that I don't have time to tell you about. But the one experiment that gave us a clue as to how these proteins might be working was this finding that PCBP1 seems to form droplets in vitro with the e-repeat RNA. And, and I show you here uh, recombinant PTBP1 in vitro with different concentrations of the e-repeat RNA. And you can see that the concentration of the RNA has an effect on how the droplets present. But this was interesting to us because it suggested that perhaps these proteins were binding the e-repeat of exist at a high enough concentration to initiate some sort of condensation event. So to test this hypothesis more thoroughly, we turn to known mutations in Matron 3 and TDP43 that are involved in regulating uh, phase separation in cells. And so we know that if you mutate Matron 3 at serine 85 in cells, this affects the ability of stress granules to form. And stress granules are known to form through a phase separation uh, type event. And so mutating matron 3 and trying and asking if we recruit this mutated form of matron 3 to the delta e exist can it rescue exist localization and as you can see here it cannot it looks just like the e-repeat deletion phenotype and in fact if we mutate tdp43 at four point mutations that have been shown to interfere with its phase separation in vivo in fact this mutant of tdp43 cannot rescue exist localization and they cannot rescue excellent gene silencing and so i'll turn now to our conclusions which is that we we believe that we've uh, uncovered a compartmentalization model for exist localization and gene silencing which works this way upon uh, the initiation of x chromosome activation exist binds the proteins that it's going to form the exist RN, uh, ribonuclear protein complex with. And this RNP spreads across the X chromosome to instate X-linked gene silencing. And we believe this very initial step is independent of the e-repeat. But then the proteins that bind the e-repeat become increasingly important as they, as they become more concentrated and as exist levels rise during the initiation of X chromosome inactivation. And once they reach a certain threshold, we believe these proteins undergo a condensation event that forms a compartment that can then enforce exist localization and sustain excellent gene silencing on the X chromosome in an E-dependent fashion. And we believe that this condensate becomes essential as X chromosome initiation transitions to X independence. And what I don't have time to show you is that this condensate is stable in the absence of exist. And so we believe, and we're very excited about this new model in which the, we think RNA mediated protein condensation acts as a mechanism of epigenetic gene regulation. And this is work that we're continuing to, to investigate and, and is a new and, and fun avenue for us to take this work and research. So I will end there and I will thank you for your time. Um, I also thank the conference organizers and the host for this chance to share our work with you. Again, this work was done in the lab of Catherine Plath uh, at UCLA and it's been a great honor to be mentored by her. She's an incredibly curious scientist. Um, uh, a lot of the high resolution images I showed were taken by Yolanda McCarkey in the lab and, uh, and Jacques Cerise helped get this um, project off the ground in the early stages. I happened to do my work with another fabulous scientist uh, during my PhD, who's Doug Black, also at UCLA, and he works on PTBP1, so it's been a real pleasure to be able to collaborate with Doug on PTBP1 in this um, EXIST project. Mitch Gutman uh, and Chung Kan Chen did the RAPSEQ uh, in Mitch Gutman's lab, and I've been very fortunate to be funded by the Helen Hay Whitney Foundation and the NIH. And uh, uh, our manuscript is on BioArchive, and so I encourage you to read it there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, very nice presentation. Um, <clears throat> are there questions? Oops. I, could I ask a question? Sure, please. It is a fabulous talk and I don't have a background to understand 
all of it. Maybe I ask you a couple of questions. Are these two proteins um, intrinsically disordered? These, the, the, I, I even forget the name of the two proteins. Um, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, TDP43 is a classically disordered, well, the, the C-terminal domain is, is disordered and in fact, it it's aggregates so easily in vivo, I mean, in vitro, that when we purify TDP43 and we've done this in, you know, or the Eisenberg lab here at UCLA has done it and they have to purify it with sumo tags on it and stuff to stop it from, you know, aggregating in vivo, uh, in vitro, sorry. Um, so TDP43 is yes, Matron3 has some intrinsically disordered domains and and in PTB, in talking to Doug, if you look, you can find intrinsically disordered domains, but they they don't present as as having these massively, you know, IDR regions. So, so maybe it, it's that when they all come together, they sort of enhance each other or the condensate may not phase separate. It may be some other sort of condensation event. And that's something we're investigating, whether it really is true phase separation or some sort of other um, sort of dynamic interactions that these proteins are undergoing to form a compartment. May I ask one other question? Yeah. Um, is it possible to interpret this appearance of uh, the importance of this E repeat at later times because the condensate has to form and only then that interaction is getting recruited. Uh, and if so, could you do an experiment where you could form this condensate outside and then introduce it and then you would abrogate this uh, initial uh, phase completely? Huh. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the one thing is so, if you take the e-repeat, I haven't done this work, but it's been published on BioArchive and um, by the Weeks Lab. If you take the e-repeat and you put it into another RNA, it, and they use a cytoplasmic RNA, it seems to be able to form some con um, foci in the cytoplasm that may be a condensate. For exist, you have to get exist to spread across the X. So. It's a kind of experiment we could think about doing. I haven't really thought about that, about how to form the condensate in the absence of the e-repeat and then ask whether you can recruit these proteins into it. But I mean, we, we could make, we could try and maybe we could discuss offline. I, I haven't thought about it too much. I think, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I got a couple of other questions coming in here. Uh, one question, uh, I was wondering, is it possible to perturb the inactivated X chromosome by changing salt concentrations? That's um, difficult to do in vivo. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so X chromosome activation is really an in vivo, uh, to study it, it's hard to study in vitro because you've got to get it to spread across the X chromosome. And exist is, you know, 18 KB long as an RNA, so to transcribe it is, is close to impossible, at least in, in vitro. So. So that's something we don't know. A second question, and I, I will follow you up with a question in this one. Um, if you add other proteins to the solution where you are forming your droplets, um, do they it, it perturb the, the process or get involved in it? Uh, yep, so, so those are good. That's a great question, and that's work we're doing. So. Um, one, I just found out today that the work got accepted for publication, so that was really exciting. And in the yeah. review process, <laughs> thank you. In the review process, one of the reviewers asked us to do this. And so we took self because TDP43 just aggregates when you make it, and Matron3 similarly does the same thing. So we were able to express self1 in, in uh, recombinantly. And so when we added self1 to these droplets, what we found is that self at high con when you add self to PTB, under conditions where PTBP1 forms droplets with the e-repeat, self1 then causes these things to look like aggregates. Um, now, Geraldine Dent Seydu has published work showing that what looks like aggregates by, by you know, light microscopy, when you use fluorescence and FRAP, these things are actually quite mobile. So it doesn't have to be a round droplet to necessarily still be a condensate. So, so we're still characterizing what these 
aggregate like looking structures are. They may actually be condensates and they look similar to things that um, Roy Parker has published and just look which are formed just of RNA. So, so the point is the appearance of these structures, droplets, in vivo structures, I'll call them um, assemblies, they change when we add self one to the PTB droplet, they become more elongated and aggregate looking like, like aggregates. Um, we haven't added other proteins that we don't know. But, uh, so proteins that we know don't bind the e-repeat, we haven't added those yet. And those are experiments we need to do. So a question I would have, is the formation of the droplet specific to the e-repeat? Or if you use another RNA of the same length, do you see droplet formation? Good question. So we've used other regions of exist as controls. Now, PTB, you know, will bind CU regions. And so it's hard to find a length matched region that does of exist that doesn't have CU repeats. Now the e-repeat has 50, over 50 sigmas of CU binding sites. So it's a heavy, heavy CU rich sequencing combined many PTBs. We, we, we think probably 50 monomers per e-repeat. So if we take an RNA sequence that's length match that has only five uh, CU repeats, it can form droplets. Um, the droplets are much, much smaller and at lower concentrations of PTB where the e-repeat will form droplets, the, co the control RNAs won't. So it, it's not so much that other regions don't form droplets, it's that the droplets form at, they're bigger in size and they form more readily with the e-repeat at lower PTB concentrations. Have you had a chance to put the low density repeats in vivo and see if they're active? You mean change the number of repeats? Yeah, yeah that's, that's something we want to do to see at what, what's the minimum number of repeats that you can get. I mean, that would go a long way to showing that this really is a condensation event. So that's an experiment we need to do. Uh, now, Rup Chattabarty, who's one of the organizers of this in collaboration with uh, Rick and I, and, and I think it's been observed before. If you form a large enough condensate and then uh, modulate the, the factor forming it, let's say take excess away as you have, uh, the theoretical system will predict that they can be stable. Right. So the experiment at the end of the, your presentation where you delete excess and you still had these, these proteins forming a concentrated condensate uh, could be explained by that. It could be explained by many things. Yes, yes. I mean, that's an observation that, that that we need to investigate further. This was deleted when we took, I didn't have time to show, but I asked, saw you asked a, a question earlier about enrichment of proteins on the inactive X chromosome. So, so PRC2 and, and proteins that are involved in um, uh, heterochromatin formation, they do transiently enrich on the inactive X chromosome as initiation is beginning. Mm -hmm. And then the heterochromatic marks like K27 trimethylation, they can be seen to enrich on the inactive X chromosome in an exist dependent fashion. We looked for enrichment of these proteins on the X and we find that only self one we can see enrichment of. Um, we can't really understand, we haven't been able to, to see enrichment of matron three or TDP 43. Uh, PTB P2, P1 we do see enrichment of under certain conditions. And so we wonder whether sometimes in these condensates, because these proteins are such high uh, highly expressed in the nucleus and they're already there at high concentration, you may not need to concentrate them that much more for them to function. Um, and so, so actually, so that gets me to the point that we're actually interested in, in the makeup and the stoichiometry of this assembly and this, you know, condensate and to ask, you know, all those questions about how stable it is and, and how the stability is, is, is achieved and maintained. Thank you. Thank you very much. Other questions? I don't want to, we got time. I don't see any hands. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Fine presentation, excellent presentation. Um, so we'll turn to uh, the last uh, presentation and it's by uh, Chad Stein at Harvard Medical School. Uh, exploring how the integrator complex attenuates transcription 
in mammalian cells. Uh, Chad? Hello, everyone. My name is Chad, and I'm a third year graduate student in Karen Edelman's lab at Harvard Medical School. Today, I'm excited to share part of my thesis work with you, in which I'm trying to understand how the integrator complex regulates transcription in metazoans. So as I'm sure everyone in this audience is already familiar with, transcription is fundamentally important in allowing cells and organisms to respond to their environments. In the case of innate immunity, for example, when a cell like a macrophage encounters an invading pathogen, it needs to rapidly mount a response to prevent damage to the organism. Indeed, the initial response is achieved within tens of minutes. And over the last several decades, it's been apparent that early steps in transcription elongation are critical. Specifically, promoter proximal pausing and the re release of RNA polymerase pul into productive elongation is a key regulatory step that allows gene promoters to remain open and accessible, but do not commit the cell to making a full length transcript. More recently, however, another fate for RNA pul 2 has become increasingly appreciated, and that is premature transcription termination. Here, instead of being released into a gene body, the pause polymerase is released from its DNA template and the short RNA it has generated is degraded. This interesting observation raises two questions. First, is this termination passive? Or in other words, is it an inherent feature of PAL2? Or alternatively, is it a regulated fate that the cell can control? Second, one might wonder why, after putting so much effort into the upstream steps, including binding of transcription factors, recruitment of co-activators, and assembly of the pre-initiation complex, there would be a short circuit mechanism to prevent transcription of a gene. And the work I'm going to do will hopefully address both of these questions. So I wanted to start out by giving you the punchline, which is that our lab and others have recently shown that the integrator complex is responsible for inducing promoter proximal termination in a regulated manner. So what is the integrator complex? Integrator is a metazone specific complex comprised of at least 14 subunits that was originally discovered as generating the three prime ends of nascent pre-SNRNAs. Importantly, two of its subunits, integrator 9 and integrator 11, are homologous to CPSF100 and CPSF73, which cleave nascent mRNAs near polyadenylation sites. And like the cleavage and polyadenylation machinery, integrator interacts with RNA polymerase 2. In addition to cleaving pre-SNRNA 3 prime ends, integrator is shown to act on enhancer 3 prime ends, enhancer RNA 3 prime ends. And of the 14 subunits shown here, most of them have unknown functions. So to give you an idea of how integrator works, I wanted to first describe it at how it works at SNRNA loci where it was first discovered. First, SNRNA specific transcription factors like SNAP-C recruit integrator to the promoter. After polymerase transcribes through the SNRNA gene body, it transcribes a regulatory element called the three prime box, after which integrator cleaves the RNA to release it for further processing. Importantly, shown within the schematic are two hints as to how integrator might be regulated. First, it is recruited to this locus by a transcription factor. Second, there is a signal that tells INS9 and INS11 to cleave. Importantly, this three prime box is a highly degenerate motif, so it's unlikely that there's a strict sequence requirement for the triggering of catalysis. So with this in mind, plus the observation that integrator might act at other loci, our lab and others uh, and our collaborators set out to characterize integrator function elsewhere in the genome. So this work was led by my former colleague Talmo Henriquez, and his counterpart, Nathan Elrod, from Ag Eric Wagner Lab in Texas. So first, Nathan and Telmo depleted one half of integrator's catalytic module, INS9, in Drosophila cells. As you see on the scatter plot of RNA-seq data, depletion of INS9 by RNAi led to a significant upregulation of over 700 protein coding genes and downregulation of less than 200. Notably, these downregulated genes were affected to a much smaller degree than the upregulated ones, leading us to conclude that integrator's main function is to repress transcription at these loci. Next, our labs wanted to understand how integrator affects nascent transcription. To do this, Nathan and Telmo used precision run-on sequencing, or ProSeq, to localize polymerase at high resolution. Importantly, ProSeq relies on biotinylated NTPs being incorporated into a nascent RNA by a previously engaged RNA pul 2 molecule. This allows single nucleotide resolution mapping of actively transcribing polymerase, represented by blue signal on this heat map. Here in the control setting, we see that the genes most affected by integrator depletion at the top have significant polymerase signal at their promoters, but little in their gene bodies. Incredibly, when INS9 is knocked down, these same genes have a large increase in gene body polymerase, showing that integrator was attenuating productive elongation under control conditions. 
Additionally, as one might expect, Nathan and Telmo found that using ChIP-seq to the INT12 subunit of integrator, the complex is enriched at genes that are affected by the integrator depletion compared to those that are not. Interestingly, however, they found integrator signal at genes not transcriptionally affected by integrator loss, regularly erasing the possibility that recruitment of the complex to promoters can be promiscuous, but cleavage could be more highly regulated. Next, my colleagues wanted to study the role of integrators' catalytic activity in transcription. To do this, they depleted the catalytically active subunit, INS11, using RNAi, and then rescued with either a wild type or previously described catalytically dead INS11 transgene called E203Q. Here, we can see the dramatic results using RNA-seq. Under control conditions, integrator targets are literally expressed due to integrators' attenuation activity. When INS11 was depleted, this locus was derepressed. When rescued with wild-type INS11, expression was decreased to wild-type-like levels. And note that the E203Q mutant rescue phenocopied INS11 depletion, showing that INS11 catalytic activity is necessary for integrator-mediated attenuation. Importantly, this was too true transcriptome-wide, as demonstrated by this heat map. Specifically, we see that INS11 depletion causes significant upregulation of genes, rescue with a wild-type transgene rescues this, and rescue with a catalytically dead allele does not, and may even make things worse. So the data I just showed you, plus a lot I won't have time to discuss, led to a model whereby integrator is recruited to promoters and associates with RNA pol 2 in its paused state. Then a decision can be made. Either integrator does nothing, and polymerase is allowed to enter productive elongation, or integrator can cleave the nascent RNA, triggering transcription termination and release of the short RNA for exosome-mediated degradation. So in summary, the message I hope you take home from this is that integrator cleaves target mRNAs which causes premature transcription termination. So while these findings were very exciting for our labs, they left open even more questions than they answered. For example, why is integrator targeted to some mRNA promoters, but not all? Is it a transcription factor-based mechanism like at snRNAs? Second, at the places it is recruited to, how does integrator's catalytic module decide whether to cleave or not and where? I showed you that by ChIP-seq, genes that are not transcriptionally regulated by integrator might still have the complex at their promoters, so why are they not repressed? So to answer these questions and others, I've been working on moving this system or these questions to mouse embryonic stem cells, which will allow me not only to address questions of integrator function at steady state, but also under dynamic differentiation conditions. So to start out, I depleted INS11 using siRNA for 48 hours, then performed RNA-seq. On the x-axis is RNA-seq signal after control siRNA treatment, and on the y-axis is signal from cells treated with INS11 and siRNA. Here, you can see that my results mirror those from Drosophila, whereby many more genes are upregulated by integrator loss than are downregulated. This again supports the idea that integrator mainly acts to repress targets. Notably, the upregulated genes are spread out over a large range in the upper part of this graph, whereas the downregulated genes are all only slightly downregulated. Next, I wanted to know if genes regulated by integrator have different basal expression than those not. Again, similarly to Drosophila, I found that genes repressed by integrator have much lower basal expression than unaffected or downregulated genes highlighting the power of integrator to prevent their expression. Here, I just wanted to show two examples of integrator targets. First up is June, which is an immediate early gene, and this is a class of genes consistently found to be regulated by integrator across species and cell types. Additionally, I found that many Wnt ligands were highly upregulated by integrator loss, and these data and others support a role for integrator in repressing genes involved in signaling. So while all this is well and good, it's the result of 48 hours of protein depletion, raising the possibility of off-target effects. So to circumvent this, I want to use a rapid protein depletion strategy that will allow me to more rigorously define integrator targets and probe the most proximal effects on transcription. So to do this, I aim to homozygously insert an N-terminal halo tag into mouse embryonic stem cells at the INS11 locus. This will allow me to treat cells with a small molecule degrader called halo protec and target INS11 for degradation by the proteasome. Additionally, the flexibility of the halo tag system will allow for many other applications like chip, clip, and IP mass spec, all of which I plan on doing in the future. I also included the 11 amino acid high bit sequence N terminal to the halo tag. The high bit peptide is used for a luciferase complementation assay, which provides sensitive quantification of INS11 protein levels and will be especially useful during degradation experiments. So using CRISPR-Cas9, I was able to generate two homozygous halotag knock-in clones, as shown by genomic PCR and agarose jello electrophoresis. In parallel, I also isolated control clones, which received Cas9 and INS11 guide RNAs, but no repair template. 
Next, I performed Western blotting for endogenous since 11 and showed that my two homozygous clones have a band at the appropriate size for the halo tagged protein, but no endogenous protein. And probing using an antibody specific for the halo tag itself shows the same result. Finally, I performed a pilot degradation time course to determine how rapidly I could deplete into 11 in cells. I treated my homozygous clones with DMSO or 10 micromolar holoprotec 3 for two or four hours, then subjected them to the high bit assay I discussed earlier. So here we see that under control conditions, I can reliably detect halo into 11, which is represented as background subtracted luminescence. And in what was a pleasant surprise for me, you can see that in two hours, I can deplete INS11 to the same degree that I can with 48 hours of siRNA treatment. And this will allow me to really hone in on the direct targets of integrator, especially when paired with nascent RNA sequencing. So moving forward, I'm excited to use my newly generated cell lines to understand how integrator affects transcription at the shortest time scale described to date. I'm also eager to leverage the power of the HALO tag system to probe integrator integrator's protein partners, and localization on the genome in order to understand more about its regulation. Finally, I'll take advantage of the catalytically dead allele I described earlier to see how the catalytic activity affects integrator's function, localization, and interactions with proteins and RNA. And finally, I'd like to thank everyone involved in this work, especially Karen for being a supportive mentor, Talmo and Nathan for really spearheading the Drosophila work, and members of the Edelman Lab for their scientific advice and collaborative spirit. Thank you. Thank you. Um, questions? I have lots of them if they don't. <laughs> so, There's one you raised hand. Oh, yes. Um, uh, Suba? Uh, uh, thanks very much. Uh, so, I, I, I was wondering if you have tried to look at the statistics of the and by statistics, I, gener I mean like the noise in expression of variance and so on of the genes that are the targets of integrator versus genes that are non targets. Just uh, uh, since uh, uh, the premature uh, 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 elimination and cleavage uh, might uh, change, uh, I guess, the bursting dynamics. Uh, so, do you see a difference in, let's say, the noise in the expression of the target and non-target genes? Uh, that's a really interesting question. Unfortunately, the, uh, the sad answer is no, I haven't looked at that. Um, I, I think I haven't thought enough about how bursting works in general, but obviously it's a very important phenomenon. Um, so, I could see myself looking into that in the future, and I'm, I'd be happy to take any specific suggestions you have. Oh, okay, thanks very much. Yeah, I don't, I can't think of anything right now. It, it just seems that it should really tie in with the, with the dynamics. And I guess if you already have a list of genes which you see are, are targets and which are not, uh, it should be, uh, you can already use the available RNSC data and try to look at that instead of generating new, uh, new data from scratch, I guess. Yeah, that's a really great suggestion. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, there are lots of questions. <laughs> so, um, the, uh, and this may relate to the question you just answered, but I didn't catch it. Um, do you have any, other than low levels of expression, other marker as to why this subset of genes are induced? No, so unfortunately I don't have chip from these cells. Okay. Um, so I think sort of the, the trivial answer to your question could be just that they're the ones that have the most integrator at them. Um, but without that data, I can't really say one way or the other, but that's a, that's a good question. So uh, this process occurs downstream of the pause P CDK9 modification. There's likely to be other factors modifying the polymerase carboxytrum of the vein. Is there any correlation with its engagement with the nucleosome? I mean, we published that, that there was a, 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 an enhanced pausing uh, around the nucleosome and potential termination downstream. Yeah, sorry. Again, I don't have an answer to that, um, but that's certainly something that I can look into, um, and we're very familiar with your data. So, um, yeah, that's a good point. 
I'm also, when you look at enhancers, do you see the same effect? Uh, do almost all enhancer RNAs get induced in your short uh, term uh, depletion? Yeah, so in the Drosophila data, they did find there was, it was about 15% of promoter, mRNA promoters and 15% of enhancers were affected by integrator depletion. Hmm. Um, unfortunately, from my like steady state RNA seq, I can't really make any strong conclusions about that. But once I have the nascent data, then um, that will hopefully become possible. Okay. Yep. Um, uh, you got a nice system <laughs> set up now. <laughs> it, it should be um, something you can get a, a number of, uh, of results from. Yeah, here's hoping. Okay. Uh, are there other um, questions? I'm just checking here. No. Um, any any other questions? So, uh, hearing none, we're uh, uh, a little early, but um, thank you very much. Thank you.